I will first present the current process uh, going on in, in FAO and, and partners because we are supported in, in that work by many partners, some of uh, which are here. I should mention uh, GIZ and uh, uh, IFAD, among the most important partners, uh, drafting uh, voluntary guidelines for responsible governance of land and, and natural resource tenure. Uh, tenure is important because the tenure system determines who can use what resources and with what type of, of security, conditions, incentives for investments, etc. Governance of tenure is important uh, because, first, because people see it. When Transparency International uh, prepared the Global Corruption Barometer 2009, 15% of people uh, reported that uh, they have to pay a bribe when they are in contact with, with land services and that uh, the, the land administration sector is, is one where corruption is, is important. Uh, and when there is bad governance in land, tenure and land administration, this affects mostly uh, poor people. Uh, insecure tenure leaves uh, people, especially poor people, uh, vulnerable to eviction, to arbitrary decisions, to uh, extractions of, of, of rents from uh, public, from officials. Then what are voluntary guidelines? Uh, FAO has been producing an, a number of, of voluntary guidelines. You, you will see some examples that on the next slide. Uh, these guidelines define principles, provide a benchmark. They are voluntary. They are not binding uh, international law. They are not human rights law. They do not replace laws or, or treaties. They are, I would say, a consensual uh, basis on principles and benchmarks from which various groups of, of actors can, uh, can take action. Various groups of stakeholders, uh, governments, land administration, people, uh, civil society, groups, private sector, can use these uh, as a tool. They can. Uh, but in order to, to be able to do that, uh, first the, the guidelines must, must exist. And, and uh, for, for that, the, the process is, is important. Uh, the voluntary guidelines on, on land, on the responsible tenure of land, gov governance of land, are part of a family of instruments. Uh, FAO has produced a uh, voluntary a code of conduct on, on pesticides, voluntary guidelines on the right to food, which are maybe the, the most uh, famous. They, they have been translated into constitutions of, of several countries. They have been used in some countries to. Um, to uh, engage by some civil society groups in some cases to uh, engage with the government or to, uh, to contest some actions by a big private investor or, or government. Uh, they also exist on, on such technical topics as fire management, uh, responsible management of planted forest, etc. Uh, currently, we are developing these voluntary guidelines. I say currently because actually uh, uh, the day before yesterday was the last day mm -hmm. to receive comments on the, the zero draft of, of the voluntary guidelines and uh, my colleagues and, and myself until yesterday evening and my colleagues still the other days of this week are busy compiling the comments on the zero draft to prepare the, the draft one. Uh, this is a process that began in 2006, uh, several studies, some of them quite uh, concrete. For instance, there are regional studies on uh, the governance of, of land in Central Africa, in West Africa, in Latin America, uh, Asia, and all, all of these are, are available uh, on the web or upon request if, if you want to ask me or my colleagues. Uh, they were, between the end of 2009 and, and November last year, uh, 15 consultation meetings. 
uh, each of them bringing together uh, people from the public sector, civil society, private sector and academia. Each consultation resulted in a regional or thematic assessment uh, summarizing the issues and the recommendations from these local actors for that specific uh, region or for that specific uh, topic. Topics included uh, uh, private sector investment, uh, indigenous people, uh, civil society in, in, in general, uh, land administration. Oh, this is the, the, the current process. You see uh, 16 of, of May, that was two days ago. Uh, between uh, tomorrow, actually between this week and uh, May 30, uh, we are working on the production of the first draft. Uh, in, in June and July, it will be discussed with an open-ended working group of the, the Committee on Food Security. Uh, of which FAO, for which FAO provides the secretariat, but this is a multi-stakeholder multi all, all the group. Um, in uh, July, end of July, actually it will be one week uh, or two weeks earlier, between six, uh, around mid-July, mid uh, there will be a, a review of the first draft, not the zero draft. Uh, and in October this year, uh, there will be a discussion and consideration of the, of the final draft uh, by the, the Committee uh, for Food Security, uh, which is convening the member countries of, of FAO, but uh, also uh, civil society and, and other uh, UN organizations, especially those based in Rome, and working on food security. And uh, from that, the, the road, the, 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 these guidelines would uh, acquire the, their final uh, format and content and have some, uh, some international uh, legitimacy allowing them to be, uh, to be used uh, either in, in regional um, capacity building uh, efforts uh, in some implementation guides on, on various topics and actually uh, based on, on, the pre on the current uh, content we have already began to work on, on some of the implementation uh, guides. Um, so that is October, this year is an important uh, deadline. It's not the end of the process, but it's the end of the preparation and endorsement of the text. Then what is in, in this document? I can share with you, I, okay, it's readable, I can share with you the table of content of the, uh, of the zero draft. First draft will be available in uh, 12 days. Uh, the first part discussed the objectives and the, the nature and scope, uh, then some general uh, matters on issues such as rights and responsibilities, then a, a part on the legal recognition and allocation of tenure rights, uh, addressing issues such as uh, informal tenure, indigenous and customary tenure, Uh, part four addresses will address issues such as uh, markets in land, <coughs> investments, concessions, including uh, the, the issue of a large land acquisition, uh, what is uh, usually referred to uh, in, in the press as uh, land grabbing, the most popular uh, label that we don't use. Uh, land consolidation, restitution, redistribution, expropriation and compensation. Then one part on uh, land administration, the issues of, of disputes, transboundary issues, uh, and then some issues which are not exactly of the same nature in, in part six, climate change and land tenure. Uh, 
by the way, we had a consultation on uh, uh, an expert consultation on uh, land tenure in climate change mitigation, including uh, red. Uh, and this is available upon the request as well. Uh, so climate change, uh, natural disasters, and, and violent conflict. Okay, that's for a quick presentation of the process and the, just an ID of the content of the voluntary guidelines on, on responsible land governance. Now, uh, let me say a few words on um, the, one of the aims of, of these sessions. Uh, how could uh, issues of, of governance, how to frame the issues and how can the governance framework help in the, the European report on, on development. Uh, in, in the introductory notes to the session, it was mentioned, possible questions, uh, what working definition of the concept of governance may be used to guide the analysis in the report. Uh, I have one definition. I like, uh, which I, I adapted this from a World Bank document of 2007. Government, governance would be the way in which public institutions and decision makers, decision makers are individuals, persons that you can target and identify, how they exercise authority. I think authority is, is, is an important issue because without authority there is no management because there are no rules implemented when there is no authority. How they exercise authority, one, to define public policies and the word policies is important. For instance, where there is a clear agricultural policies or rural development policies, there's usually a, a better negotiation of international uh, large land deals. And second, to produce and deliver the public goods and, and services. Um, I think that this can be, this can be useful. Uh, then uh, a few words on, then let's continue on, on governance. From that definition, uh, a, a very simple definition and maybe very down to earth definition of governance would be that good governance means uh, public institutions that work for the development and, and for delivering public good. Um, and institutions, what are institutions? Referring to our classics, Eleanor Ostrom's institutions are rules in use. Uh, and these rules are, uh, are useful because they allow to coordinate the, the behaviors of, of different actors who may have, often have, a competing interest. And uh, this competition of interest can easily turn into uh, conflict. And uh, if the actors are not respecting some minimal uh, rules and uh, which are monitored and enforced by, by some kind of, uh, of authority, one then, two more minutes, uh, a, a few words uh, anticipating maybe the discussions uh, tomorrow. I think one of the big global uh, governance issues on, on in the area of land today is the issue of large land acquisitions. Uh, and what we see in large land acquisition is an interplay of scales uh, from the, the global scale and let's say some private financial actors uh, to the um, the most uh, local scale of uh, families and communities having customary land rights in some land abundant countries in Africa. To take an example, uh, you can have a, a Dutch uh, bank or a, a Belgian based uh, pension <coughs> fund, uh, asset management funds, uh, Dutch bank uh, buying majority stakes in some South African banks the South African bank uh, is controlling some agricultural engineering uh, companies that will uh, either buy land in South Africa or in other countries in Africa, or they, will, they may not buy land, but they will contract uh, farmers at a huge scale 
uh, to produce uh, food or, or biofuels uh, that will be sold on an international market. But this will be done uh, by farmers on land, which in many uh, countries, uh, land who does not have some kind of legal land titles. And between these, uh, th these very uh, global international uh, private actors level and the local level of family and communities uh, cultivating the land in Africa, and in some cases dispossessed of the land by their own state for the public interest with or without real uh, compensation, there are different levels of decisions. Uh, and it is this um, interplay of, of scale which is an important aspect, I think, in, in the area of, of land governance. And it, it never happened uh, earlier than that such a huge amount of, of capitals were moving from one continent to another to, to become invested in, in land. And that poses questions for what institutions are defining uh, the rules that can regulate what is fair behavior and what is incorrect. The rules that can define how the, the weak actors uh, can be protected uh, from uh, eviction or from uh, losing the, their livelihoods. So there is, th that's why I was mentioning uh, this morning, it's not only an issue of competing users for natural resources, it's an issue of competing users. And then a small comment on the presentation that was done just after lunch by um, Dirk uh, Willem on the analytical framework. The, one of the first slides, the first one on pathways, mentions transmission mechanism. And here we have prices and international resource flows. But there are not only transmission mechanism or mechanics, there are also some actors and, and some processes. Uh, some people are, uh, are the brokers between these different levels, these different spatial, spatial scales. Uh, and it's important to see who are the brokers, to what extent they must obey to some rules and some institutions, because the, the less there is uh, a governance framework and the less there is clear institutions defining what are the rules, uh, the more there will be uh, room of maneuver or room for arbitrary behavior by the brokers. And in many cases, the brokers are working for their own private interest. They don't work for development or for delivering public goods. So I think that is one of the challenges of governance and of, of development policies and of development aid uh, today. How to, to promote and support uh, the, the construction of, of effective governance mechanism, effective regulations, uh, fair and balanced negotiations, the, the negotiation of contracts that was mentioned uh, before. So these are part of, of the, the challenges uh, related to, to land.